Now that we understand effective osmotic pressure and the concept of reflection coefficient, I'd like to step back and talk more about effective osmolites. Osmolites that have a reflection coefficient closer to one, much like glucose that is equal to one. It is these effective osmolites that determines the tonicity of a solution with respect to a membrane. So what is the difference between osmolality or osmolarity versus tonicity. Osmolality and osmolarity, all they, they concern about is the number of particles in a solution. It does not have to deal with anything with a membrane. It's not relative to a membrane. It's just the number of particles in a solution, regardless of whether they are capable of exerting an osmotic force across the membrane. And tonicity is a property of a solution with respect to a membrane and is determined by that reflection coefficient, the closer to one it is. That means an effective osmolite exerts the full osmotic pressure. We saw that glucose exerted the full osmotic pressure and urea, the complete opposite, exerted no osmotic pressure across the membrane. So tonicity deals with the concentration of impermeant solutions, or so solutes, excuse me. So for example, we again have our cell with H2O. And now one side has urea and glucose. So can you see that osmolality on this side only deals with how much glucose and urea there are in the solution. And tonicity deals with only the glucose because urea can pass through it as an ineffective osmolite. So tonicity is only dealing with the impermeant solute. So we would say this cell is hypertonic. hypertonic solution, and this is hypotonic. Hyper, more, hypo, less. And it, it is the glucose, the effective osmolite, that drives water. The glucose is the one that exerts the osmotic pressure. So in other words, tonicity, effective osmolites, and impermeable solutes are all go together. So we've covered how osmotic pressure gradient will influence the flow of fluid and we've quantified it with a Van Hoff's equation which is a more ideal equation and we've moved up and more advanced equation as the effective osmotic pressure with its flexion coefficient, which is the fraction of solutes reflecting off the membrane. And, and now how do we quantify the flow of fluid due to the osmotic pressure? So if the osmotic pressure is a force and there's a flow of fluid due to it. Well, if you think back to your introductory physics, we had Ohm's law to describe flow. And we were talking about, in physics, we were talking about a wire with an electrical charge and a resistor. So we have a current flowing across the wire and we have a resistor. This is a resistor. And it's resisting the flow of this current, this charge, charge per unit of time. And driving this current is voltage. And this, this drove the current across the resistor. And the equation for Ohm's law was I R equals V. This described how voltage and current are interrelated by the quality of the resistor. Suppose we want to describe I equals one over R times V. Now, what is this one over R? It's the opposite of R when R, when resistance is increasing, then 1 over R is decreasing. It's an opposite concept of resistance. One possible term could be conductivity.
if a resistance is opposing action, then conductivity is more of an aiding action. It's how easily can this flow go through. In a similar fashion, if we look at this equation and compare Ohm's law with, with our cell, we had a cell before and we had a semi-permeable membrane and there were some impermeable particles here such as glucose and there was water H2O on both sides and we saw that there was a fluid flow and how can we describe the flow with this equation now if we look at Ohm's law this this the voltage is driving a current so this could be our osmotic pressure and conductivity can be describing the resistance due to the semi-permeable membrane. How is this membrane opposing a flow of water across? So maybe we would describe this as 1 over R equals a current. So in, in, in uh, physiology, we'll just label this current as J, JW, current of water. This is a pressure gradient. This is a gradient. There's a difference. There's a delta P. Now let's just break this down so we see a concept. So we'll replace 1 over R with L. Instead of using C, we talk about C as concentration. We'll just use L for conductivity. And we have, we'll, let's replace this effective osmotic pressure with uh, Van Hoff's osmotic pressure, which is a more ideal solution. So we have the osmotic pressure. And then we just have our reflection coefficient. And this equals JW, fluid flow. Now you can see how conductivity was describing how the solvent or water was flowing across the membrane. Conductivity is a property of how well the solvent crosses the membrane. And the reflection coefficient is a property of the solute. crossing the membrane. So there's two things. There's a solvent. How easily can this water flow across? And a solute, is it is it permeable or impermeable to the membrane? Remember if the reflection coefficient was 1, like such as glucose, then it's impermeable to the membrane and it exerts a full osmotic pressure. But in order for the solvent to flow across, it needs to cross the membrane and so we have a term right here, this is conduct conductivity of the membrane, and that describes how easily can solvent, or in our case, water, crosses the membrane. And I might have alluded to before, but each compartment in our body fluid ha has a major solute. And the extracellular fluid the extracellular fluid has, as its major solute, sodium. So this, this is this interstitial fluid. This is plasma. Intercellular fluid has potassium as its major solute. So there are proteins in, the, in your blood vessels, but they're large and they're, they're not that many. And there's much more sodium. These representative solutes act to hold water into their respective compartments. So sodium acts to keep water in its compartment and potassium acts to keep water inside the cells. And cells are able to regulate their volumes with channels. So if cell opened a potassium channel, and potassium flowed through, water will follow. Usually with a channel, water follows through and water will leave inside the cell. And if the potassium flows in, then water will follow. Similarly, with the extracellular fluid, if sodium, if there is a channel on the cell membrane and it opened and sodium flow into the cell, then water will follow and increase the volume inside the cell. And usually if this flow is flowing down its gradient. There's a higher concentration of sodium on, on the extracellular fluid compartment and less on the intracellular fluid compartment, so it'll flow down its gradient to reach equilibrium only if the channel is open similarly with potassium but I should also mention that this is in most of the blood vessel but if when blood reaches the capillaries you're 
you're distributing nutrition to your cells. You're delivering glucose and sodium chloride and other uh, small solids to the cell to provide nutrition. There's a different effect going on. There's a colloid osmotic pressure. Pressure. And this is due to proteins. So capillaries are highly permeable to glucose and sodium chloride and other small solutes. And so sodium and potassium, and they do not cause fluid flow. But the capillaries are very impermeable to proteins. So the proteins create the osmotic effect and will exert fluid flow at capillaries. That caps our introduction to physiology and we'll move, keep moving on. And these are the basic concepts that we'll replay in the vascular system and the gastrointestinal system and the urinary system. We'll visit these concepts many times over. See you soon. See you in the next video.